Hello and welcome to another edition of At Home with the Roosevelts. I'm Paul Sparrow, the director of the Franklin Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum. And today we're going to be talking about uh, women's equality, the evolution of the 19th Amendment, and the role that Eleanor Roosevelt uh, had in dealing with uh, women's equality movement in the 20th century. Uh, I'm joined today by two extraordinary women from the National Park Service. Uh, I'd like to welcome you both aboard today. Um, we have Susan Philpott, a park ranger at the Belmont Hall Women's Equality National Monument, and Stephanie Fries, who's the 19th Amendment Centennial Coordinator for the Women's Rights National Historical Park. Uh, thank you very much both for joining me today. Uh, Stephanie, we're going to start with you. Um, and I think, uh, can you describe what the Women's Rights National Historic Park in, in Seneca Falls is and, and sort of what's there? I certainly can. Thank you for having us, Paul. Um, so in the late 1970s, the National Park Service was seeking further opportunities to expand representation of women and minorities within national parks. Um, so that led to multiple historic studies of various places and eventually resulted in the creation of Women's Rights National Historical Park in December of 1980. Um, now, our park consists of um, essentially five structures. We have homes of three of the organizers of the 1848 Women's Rights Convention. And then we also hold the Wesleyan Chapel, which is the site where, where that historical convention took place. Um, and then we also have our, our nice big uh, visitor center just next door to the Wesleyan Chapel. Um, so for the homes, we have the home of Richard and Jane Hunt, um, which is the home that um, hosted the, the tea that started everything resulting in the convention. Um, we have the home of Marianne and Thomas McClintock, um, who were re marriage relation to Richard Hunt um, and prominent figures in Waterloo as well. Um, then we have the home of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her husband, Henry Stanton. And then there were also organizers, Martha Coffin Wright and Lucretia Mott, who were from out of town and, um, you know, were just kind of here on, on a visit um, that, that kind of culminated in the, in the convention. All right, so, Susan, tell me about the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument and uh, why it was created and, and what it, relationship it has to the Seneca Hall site. So the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument is a 200 year old house that sits on the corner of Constitution Avenue and Second Street Northeast, right on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. So we're across Constitution Avenue from the Supreme Court. The Hart Senate Office Building is all around us. Um, and since 1929, it has been the headquarters of the National Woman's Party founded by Alice Paul. Um, so, Alice Paul is uh, one of the younger generation of suffragists who came along in the early 20th century to pick up the work of that uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott had started um, at the Seneca Falls Convention, um, and particularly to focus the work for women's suffrage on the passage of an amendment to the Constitution and franchising women. So uh, they chose that location on purpose because it was right in the heart of the power uh, right on Capitol Hill. Um, it was designated a national monument by President Obama on April 12th, 2016. The, so the National Women's Party was operating since working for the 19th Amendment, although they had become an educational nonprofit and were running a museum in that house, the Sewell Belmont House, it was what they called it. We changed the name to Belmont Paul because Alice Paul is the focus of our story there. And so there's really a direct connection between these two sites. Um, so Stephanie, coming back to you, let's talk a little bit about what um, the motivation was behind the convention that took place there in Seneca Falls and the relationship between Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and, and the other team members they had that brought it all together. Okay. So I had, I had kind of briefly mentioned the, the tea that the, the tea that started it all. Um, so July 9th, 1848, five women gathered at the home of Richard and Jane Hunt to have tea. Jane Hunt had just had a baby and, um, you know, Lucretia Mott was in Auburn visiting her sister, Martha Coffin Wright, who was pregnant. 
Lucretia was on one of her kind of speaking tours in the area. Um, and so they all gathered for tea. And while they were there, they got into conversation about the things that were um, the things that were frustrating them as far as the condition of women, the, the subservience that women were forced into, the things that they wanted to be able to do themselves or wanted women to be able to do that, that they just couldn't because of laws and regulations and even social structure at the time. Um, so they, you know, things like, um, you know, not not being able to um, maintain any relationship with your children upon divorce, um, not being able to leave a husband if he was abusive, not even being able to maintain any income that women earned. Um, so there were all of these different issues that they were talking about. Um, and they circled back around to a conversation that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott had had when they met in London in 1840 at an anti-slavery convention. They didn't have a great experience there. And they said, someday we're going to have, you know, we're going to have a, a convention talking about women's rights. So while they were sitting around the tea table that day, they went back to that conversation. And these five women were like, you know what, we're going to do it. We're going to do it now while Lucretia's in town. People already follow her. She already has, you know, an established reputation. If she's there, people will come. So that left them 10 days to, from, from this tea until the convention, they put notices in the paper. They sent letters out to everybody. Um, they, they worked their contacts in the abolition networks to, to get people to come and spread the word. Um, over the course of that 10 days, um, Marianne McClintock, her daughter Elizabeth, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton gathered in the McClintock home and they composed the Declaration of Sentiments. Um, based on the Declaration of Independence, it listed the grievances that women had about rights that they wanted or rights that they didn't have. Um, so they had they had their grievances, they had their resolutions. Um, the, the big notable difference, of course, as many know, between the Declaration of Independence and the Declaration of Sentiments is, is their key change at the beginning, all men and women are created equal. And so that's the ide ideology that drove the next 72 plus years, is all men and women are created equal. Um, you know, really looking at, um, you know, how both genders should have all of the exact same opportunities and if laws need to change, then that's what, what we're going to make happen. Um, so July 19th and 20th, 1848, 300 people um, gather at the Wesleyan Chapel in Seneca Falls, and they, they discuss this declaration, they discuss these grievances, and um, you know, they, for the most part, come to consensus, and people are, are supportive of all of the, the resolutions in there until it got to enfranchisement. And even a couple of the organizers were like, whoa, you've gone too far. They thought Elizabeth Cady Stanton had lost her mind. Like, let's let's work for what's attainable. Let's, you know, not get so far out into unrealistic ideologies. Um, and even the, the crowd that was in attendance was very reluctant. You know, they were on board with the rest, but when it came to enfranchising women, um, you know, they, they kind of stepped back and were like, okay, hang on a second. Um, and that is when the, the only known person of color, um, in attendance at the convention, Frederick Douglass stepped up and spoke, and it was actually his impassioned plea for enfranchising women that got the attendees of the convention on board and finally got them all or a hundred of the 300 um, 68 women, 32 men to sign on to this declaration of sentiments. Um, so fast forward a few years and, you know, there's multiple conventions popping up all over the country. You know, they, there was one a couple weeks later in Rochester, Philadelphia, Boston, all of these other big cities started to have one as the, the movement started to take on steam. Um, now you mentioned Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony did not attend the 1848 convention. She was not, she had not found her role in activism quite yet. Um, she had family members who attended the convention in Rochester that took place two weeks later, but it wasn't until I, I believe 1852 or 1853 that Susan B. Anthony attended her first women's rights convention. 
Um, so Amelia Bloomer introduced Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton in Seneca Falls in 1851. And if you ever make it to Seneca Falls, we have a beautiful little statue there that kind of marks it. And it was like the seas parted when these two women met. They were just, they were kindred spirits. They they thought a lot of the same ways and, and they had the same goals most of the time, although not all of the time. There were things they disagreed on. So these two women worked together in, in partnership and sisterhood for over 50 years. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny. So uh, in, the, in the very early days of the movement, Elizabeth Cady Stanton had young children at home. And it was not practical or realistic for her to go and travel and give speeches and talk to crowds to further the cause and build support for the women's rights movement. Whereas Susan B. Anthony didn't have children, she wasn't married, and she loved to travel, she could go wherever she wanted. Um, so Elizabeth Cady Stanton would stay home, she would write, she would raise her children, while Susan B. Anthony would go out and travel and give the speeches that Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton had had multiple children and it got to like there were times where it was hard for her to kind of set her household obligations aside to be able to dedicate time to, um, you know, writing letters for publication or writing these speeches. Um, so Susan B. Anthony would actually go over to Elizabeth Cady Stanton's house and babysit. Um, she would she would help take care of the children. She would help manage the household a little bit to give Stanton the opportunity to sit down and, and focus on her writings and focus on the cause. Um, and I don't recall where it is, but at one point, um, the children commented that they actually liked Aunt Susan's pudding better than mom's. <laughs> um, so so Aunt Susan made made better pudding than Elizabeth Cady Stanton did. And it was so it so offended Susan that her pudding just wasn't good enough that she included it in, um, I believe, 80 years or more, a, a book that she wrote later in her life. So that was that was kind of one of the big deal things. But that's how close they were is, is you know, she was an aunt to Stanton's children. Um, and, and they stayed that close for the duration of their lives. Now, they spent the next 50 years fighting for women's equality, trying to move um, the country forward. Um, but neither of them lived long enough to see the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, and in that early part of the 1900s, when they both pass away, there really is this generational shift. Uh, and this is where Alice Paul enters the picture and the, the National Women's Party sort of takes up this, what becomes an increasingly uh, militant uh, effort uh, to get uh, women the right to vote. So talk a little bit about that, Stephanie, I mean, Susan, and what was happening in Washington at that moment? Sure. Well, first of all, I do have to say that Carrie Chapman Catt, the leader of the National American Women Suffrage Association, would not have cared for your characterization that Alice Paul was the one who took up Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton's work because she knew them both, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt did, and saw that she was doing their work. Um, Alice Paul, although she often referenced Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, never met them. And she got involved in the suffrage movement when she was... Um, enjoying the some of the benefits that the first generation had worked for. So a lot of the things on the Declaration of Sentiments hadn't happened yet, including the right to vote, but some had, and um, there were more education and um, uh, employment opportunities available to women. And Alice Paul was one of the new women of the 20th century who were claiming their right to education and careers. And she was attending graduate school in England when she encountered the militant suffragettes led by Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters. Um, and so the British suffragettes, just like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, could give great speeches and fire people up, but they thought that the real way to change things was you had to be confrontational. You had to cause trouble. Um, their slogan was deeds, not words. And so Alice Paul gets involved in large demonstrations throughout the city with heckling politicians and interrupting them, even breaking windows sometimes and getting arrested and going to jail. 
Um, so she returns to the United States all fired up from having participated in these uh, events in Britain and returns as kind of a celebrity because the American newspapers have written about her exploits there um, and comes to join the suffragist leaders. And they are you know, happy to take advantage of her energy and her celebrity but they're a little concerned that she is a little too willing to continue this confrontational way of going about things. Her very first um, project that she takes on um, with her compatriot Lucy Burns, who she's met in the London police station, um, is to plan a huge uh, procession down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. on the day before Woodrow Wilson's presidential inauguration on March 3rd, 1913. So the idea is we are going to take over the inaugural route, which no one had ever protested there before, so that the next day Woodrow Wilson will be marching in our footsteps. And we're going to make the argument right there in the capital city that women should not be excluded from the political process, that here is an array of our accomplishments and this is why women should have the right to vote. And they included on their first float what became known as the great demand. We demand an amendment to the Constitution of the United States enfranchising women. So they're taking up an idea that Susan B. Anthony had started, uh, which was trying to win women the vote one state at a time or one election at a time was too long, taking too long. Um, and the real way that women across the country were going to win the vote was through changing the US Constitution. Now, just as uh, those attendees at the Seneca Falls Convention thought Elizabeth Cady Stanton was being a little ridiculous to include women having the right to vote in their demands, the existing suffrage leaders thought Alice Paul was crazy to think that she was going to get the U.S. Constitution changed. It's changing the U.S. Constitution is a big job. But that procession, uh, along with the publicity that went along with it, particularly as the huge crowds and attendants kind of swarmed the procession and attacked the women and women ended up going to the hospital, that re-energized, uh, gave new energy to the suffrage movement and got people talking about this idea of changing the US Constitution. It would be quite a long fight, but all along the way, Alice Paul just had this mind for political strategy and this belief that you didn't, not necessarily breaking windows, but you gotta hold people's attention. And you do that by being visible, by being sometimes transgressive, by being confrontational, by stirring things up. Now, I may be wrong on the date, but around 1916 was when the National Women's Party headquarters moved into the Belmont House. Is that correct? So that's not correct. The, the house that we're in now um, is the fifth of their headquarters. So they started in a little basement office in F Street and fairly quickly after the procession, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns have a falling out with the uh, larger suffrage organization and those leaders. So they find, found their own organization, which at first is called the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage. And later they changed in 1916, they changed the name to the National Women's Party. But during the time of the fight for the 19th Amendment, they have headquarters on Lafayette Square, right by the White House. So at first they are in um, what was called Cameron House at the time. It's now called the Benjamin Taylor House. Uh, it's still there and has a historical plaque that doesn't mention anything about Alice Paul. But it's right on Lafayette Square, just, you know, steps away from the White House. They are in there through 1917. Then they get evicted because of all the trouble they've been causing. So they move to another headquarters across Lafayette Square on Jackson Place. That house isn't there anymore. Then they move into a, head, uh, a headquarters that was in the place that the Supreme Court building is now. And pretty soon after they bought it, the federal government took it and demolished it. But they had savvy lawyers at the National Women's Party. Um, who got a healthy settlement from the federal government for that house, and with it, they bought the house that they have been in since 1929. Um, 
which they named for their chief benefactor, Alva Vanderbilt Belmont. Well, during that period, as the National Women's Party was getting started, um, Eleanor Roosevelt lived just a few miles away over on our street because uh, Franklin Roosevelt at that point was the assistant secretary of the Navy and had moved to Washington from New York. Uh, and uh, Eleanor had a very busy social schedule as the wife of the assistant secretary. And she was very much in the community of Washington on the official side of things. But she was, in fact, not a big supporter of um, suffrage and, and the idea that women should get the right to vote. That is true. So Eleanor is often, um, to our modern sensibilities, a little bit of an enigma um, because clearly she did all sorts of things uh, that helped um, in the cause of women's um, freedom to do more things. Uh, some of those things on the Declaration of Sentiments, she certainly is supporting those. Well, why wouldn't she then support women's right to vote? And there were lots of women who opposed the right to vote, some of them very actively anti-suffrage. Um, part of the argument came around this idea that there are different spheres for men and women um, that are appropriate and that men deal with the ugly, dirty business of politics, but that that somehow will affect women's respectability if they get involved in the muck in, uh, of um, political and partisan debate and that women have another role that's just as important, just as virtuous, and that is to care for the home. Uh, at the time that all of these women are functioning, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, right up to Alice Paul, there is sort of the sense that maybe women really shouldn't be out in public, um, certainly not parading down the street, that that's not what respectable women do. Um, so the suffragists who begin to use these um, public um, tactics are offending many people's sensibilities about what uh, is appropriate for women to do. Now, one of the things that Eleanor Roosevelt had in common with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony is that they were masters of the media of their day. Um, uh, the ability to generate publicity, the, their writing ability, their publications, um, you know, and, and they understood that there was these restrictions on what they could do, and yet they used the media that was available to them, uh, particularly if, for the Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, the, the idea of these pamphlets and these newspapers and these publications that they could then distribute. Uh, and they became a very powerful voice. And then, of course, when Eleanor comes along, there's also radio and her daily column. But that power of the word, talk to me a little bit about how Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, and Susan B. Anthony crafted their message in such a way that they could use the print media of their day to connect with people all across the country? Well, I, I think that's kind of twofold because it wasn't always a good thing. Um, <laughs> after after the Declaration of Sentiments, it was it was um, you know first published by Frederick Douglass, but then after that, other newspapers started to pick it up, not because they wanted to further the cause, but because they were making fun of it. Um, so in the, in the earlier years of the movement, a lot of the times when, when, you know, unless it's an advertisement for a convention, a lot of times when you'd see something in the media, it was because people were making fun of the cause, like these, these silly women, what's wrong with them? Um, and, and I think that, um, Stanton and Anthony, particularly their biggest strength was their inability to kind of ignore that and, and keep going and be able to kind of spin it. Um, a, another kind of less fantastic thing when it comes to publication, um, at one point in time, um, Stanton and Anthony were so cause focused, so mission oriented that it was, you know, we will do whatever it takes at all costs. Um, and they ended up establishing some, some partnerships with people that, that maybe, if they had had more opportunity for publication and more funding, maybe a partnership they wouldn't have looked toward. Um, but they ended up having their own their own newspaper for a little while. Um, and and, um, you know, it, yes, it was it, it had things about abolition and, and things about women's rights. And it was great. 
Um, but it was also being funded by people that hold, held some kind of controver controversial views. So some of the things that they published, um, you know, there were some really just, I mean, you can't beat around the bush. There were some disgusting, very racist things that were included in this newspaper. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's up for debate on whether, you know, this is how people really felt or, you know, this is appeasing the, the guy that holds the checkbook. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll never only know the answer to that, but, um, you know, just horrible things that, that can't be unsaid and were extremely offensive, um, you know, that, that kind of cast a, a shadow. I mean, even to this day um, over, over Stanton's legacy, we still have conversation um, around, you know, what that looked like and what it meant. And so they always say that the victor writes the history. Um, so the, the largest original publication on women's history, um, the, the history of women's suffrage was written by Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Matilda Jocelyn Gage. It, it doesn't, it, it includes their history, but it doesn't include inclusive history. Um, you know, these are middle to upper class white women. So the history that they write and the stories that they're telling, that's what is within those pages. You're not going to find the history or a conversation or around condition or employment opportunity or education opportunities for immigrants, for women of color, for um, enslaved people, freed slaves. You know, those are that that history is not held within those pages. Um, so I think that that's kind of one of the, the values that came um, later in the movement and, um, you know, in the, the years following, um, you know, and, and even and even through um, through Eleanor Roosevelt is, you know, we, we need to look at everyone. You know, there's there's more than just white women. <laughs> there's a much larger part of the population that that we need to consider here. Um, and, and that was not a prevalent part of the conversation early in the movement. Um, and unfortunately, the publications is one of the places where that part of the legacy still kind of holds. Well, that certainly Eleanor also shared with them the, uh, being the target of harsh criticism and ridicule. Um, you know, the political cartoons about Eleanor Roosevelt, the vicious editorials written about her, you know, J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, considered her a communist and, you know, had her... Um, watched and, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of that that went on even um, in the 1930s and 40s up to her death in 62. She was considered a radical and, and many of those things. Um, but I do think that you hit on this idea that there was this separation uh, between the abolition movement, which was a very connected to the women's movement in the mid 1800s to what became very separate movements and some antagonism and hostility between the two camps. Um, but and after the 19th Amendment is passed, um, Alice Paul now shifts towards the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, uh, the ERA becomes a big uh, rallying cry because they felt that the 19th Amendment didn't really address all of the issues. And the ERA is, I think, very interesting, both because of the way it evolved um, and the politics that carry all the way through till today. And the fact that once again, Eleanor Roosevelt, this great champion of human rights, this great champion of women's equality, who fought for the uh, women immigrants and the labor force, uh, didn't support the ERA. And in fact, her and Alice Paul had not a particularly friendly relationship. You want to talk about that a little bit, Susan? Sure. So, um, yes. So once women win the vote in August 1920, there certainly are people who say, you know what, this has been a long, hard fight. We've got the vote. That's it for me. But there's others who said, hey, remember that list of things on the Declaration of Sentiments? We still have a long way to go. The vote is not the end. The vote is just the beginning. We need to use our power now as enfranchised citizens to fight for true equality. Um, and the National Women's Party did that in a number of different ways, including uh, supporting women running for office and lobbying for legislation. But they went back again to this idea of changing the US Constitution. Now, maybe they forgot about how hard they worked and how many had come before them in the fight for the 19th Amendment. Um, because in addition to all sorts of publicity stunts, they picketed the White House for a long time. They also went to jail and, and um, were force fed in prison. 
when they come around to working on amending the U.S. Constitution again, you almost get the sense that maybe they, they're done with all that. That you know, now we're voters. Now we're going to go about it the way that citizens go about things without uh, causing so much trouble. But their idea is that there should be an amendment to the Constitution that had a couple of different versions. The the one that's that's out there right now reads: "Equality of rights under the law." shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And they introduced this in 1923 at a celebration of the anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention. And they get to work not picketing, not marching, but with uh, lobbying. And Alice Paul actually decides to go to law school that you know she can make any legal arguments if she if she gets her JD on top of her PhD. Um, and it's a long, hard fight. Eleanor Roosevelt is not the only one who doesn't think this is a good idea. There are lots of other people that don't, particularly, and this would be um, close to Eleanor's heart, those who had fought so hard in the labor movement. You know, and so labor leaders are some of the most committed suffragists. But one of the things that they have won in the labor movement is legislation that protects women in the workplace, that uh, limits child labor. And the argument of the labor leaders is that amendment is going to wipe out all the work that we've done. You're going to wipe out protective labor legislation for women. Um, and Alice Paul's response was good because women shouldn't be treated uh, differently in the workplace, that treating women uh, differently, having different rules for women just continues the idea that women are inferior. But, you know, she was wealthy and didn't work and she hadn't worked in the, and didn't work outside of the work for women's equality. She, she had never worked in a factory or anything like that. She didn't probably have the compassion that uh, people like Eleanor Roosevelt who had been involved in this movement and this work for so long, were not willing to, to give up um, those things they'd fought for. Um, and another point to make is um, a friend of Eleanor Roosevelt's, Polly Murray, who was uh, also a lawyer, um, who coined the term Jane Crow to um, really give voice to the idea that Black women faced double discrimination, uh, both a, as African American and as women. She also didn't support the Equal Rights Amendment because she thought women's equality was right there in the 14th Amendment, and that the way to go about this was to fight for uh, more rigorous um, enforcement and support of the 14th Amendment and uh, due process and um, equal protection for all that's already there. That if you start putting in amendments that are just talking about sex, then you're going to weaken the 14th Amendment. So there were a lot of perspectives, and it was a long fight. OK, we're now down to our last question. Uh, I'm going to ask both of you the same question, essentially. We'll start with you, Stephanie. The, the legacy for uh, the Seneca Falls Convention and Elizabeth K. Stanton and um, Susan B. Anthony, how does it resonate today? I mean, we look at today, the role that women had in the last presidential election was very significant. We now have a woman of color as the vice president of the United States, and yet the struggle continues. So, so what is their legacy today? How can the young students today look at them and what lessons can they draw? I think there's a lesson in terms of motivation and staying focused and not being detoured. Um, I think that it's important to um, you know, kind of consider that, yes, these these people largely came from, you know, families with means, but at the same time, they're just people. Um, and so they they had to build their network. They had to rely on each other that, you know, not not one person throughout the entire movement can can kind of claim ownership or say, you know, I could have done it without him. No, um, it, it really required relying on other people. Um, it requires teamwork and just kind of staying focused and staying motivated. And, um, you know, if you're doing it for the right reasons, eventually it will come to fruition. And, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be on your timeline. That's not going to be exactly how you want. It's probably not going to be pretty. Um, but, you know, just just kind of keep going. And, and eventually the, the right thing is is what will end up coming into place.
Um, and I, I think that's kind of the, the heart of, you know, in terms of, I mean, there's lessons to be learned in terms of what activism looks like and being agitators and, and things like that. But I think the heart of it is, is just, you know, continue to try to do right and right will win. And Susan, what is the National Women's Party and Alice Paul's legacy today? So one thing that Alice Paul is often quoted on is uh, where she says, uh, kind of reflecting later at, in her older years, um, that she always thought that there was nothing complicated about ordinary equality. And I always want to say to Alice Paul, do you even remember what you went through? The whole idea of equality is very complicated. And every time we start to talk about equal, it the question immediately comes up, well, who are you talking about? Equal with what? And who, when you're saying we want to be equal, who are you leaving out of that story? Um, and one lesson to me about that is that one of the things that helped women um, with equality, maybe more than anything else, because we don't have the Equal Rights Amendment, um, is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which in Title VII um, forbids discrimination in employment for race, color, religion, national origin, and sex. Now, the National Women's Party had something to do with getting that word sex in there, um, but they never really made common cause with those in the Black freedom struggle. They would ask Black women to support them, to support the ERA, but they never reciprocated. Um, and I feel like, you know, we can't know what would have happened if they had. But that, to me, is just proof that when you make common cause with others, um, that you go farther. Okay. And, and, and just the idea that equality never comes about um, just because we figure it out and things get better. It happens because people fight for it and keep fighting. Well, I think that's a message that all of the people we've talked about today would agree with. Uh, the fight is never over. Uh, Susan Philpott, thank you. Stephanie Fries, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, fascinating conversation. Uh, are, are, your, are both your parks uh, open at this point or are they still closed? So Belmont Paul is not open. Um, we have been closed since last March, uh, since the pandemic hit. It's a very small, old um, house. And also we're right on Capitol Hill, um, which is a difficult place to be right now. Um, so it has not opened to the public, although the memorials on the National Mall, of which we are a part, are, are open for people to visit. But I invite people to check out, uh, we have lots of things on our website and a pretty active social media presence. And we hope to be able to welcome people back soon. And Stephanie? Um, for women's rights in Seneca Falls, our visitor center is open. We do have limited hours, um, but we offer outdoor ranger programming seven days a week. We're also always online and trying to push out new online content. And all of our, our schedule and hours are available on our website. Well, hopefully when the weather warms up a little bit, people will have a chance to come visit you. Thank you both for joining us today. That's it for this edition of At Home with the Roosevelts. I hope to see you all again soon.